Good evening. I'm Dr. John Tempty, Associate Dean for Public Health and Community Engagement, and would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to our Hot Topics in Public Health. This is our ninth offering, providing up-to-date and complete information on important and emerging topics in public health. Since we started, we've covered COVID-19, gun violence, climate change, immigrant health, disability rights, COVID-19 and racism, and tobacco control. But tonight, we're happy to talk about misinformation and disinformation in public health. Just trying to move the, uh, could I have the next slide, please? Okay, there we go. Thank you so much. So one of our dual degree students, Samantha Crowley, during the summer of 2022, conducted a survey and interviews of public health officials in rural counties across Wisconsin. One of the emerging themes was that of misinformation and disinformation. The quote here is, I think one challenge was just so much misinformation or disinformation out there. And some of that stemmed from, it's a pandemic, it's changing. We didn't know a lot. And then we learned things, people took that as we were lying to them. Things have changed so often that it was hard to combat. One of the big problems when we deal with information in science is the lack of certainty. A wonderful quote from Jakob Ranowski is that science is a very human form of knowledge. We are always at the brink of the known. We always feel forward for what is to be hoped. Every judgment in science stands on the edge of error and is personal. Science is a tribute to what we can know, although we are fallible. Well, when we start thinking in terms of public health and ask the question, what is real and what is truth? I had to turn to a wonderful source, the uh, Velveteen Rabbit. What is real? Does it mean we have things that buzz inside and stick and a stick out handle? Real isn't how, isn't how you are made. It's a thing that happens to you. Reality has a component of internalization. And I think that is why misinformation and disinformation in public health is an incredibly complex and difficult problem. A companion piece to our discussion tonight is the upcoming discussion around the UW-Madison's Go Big Read 2023-24. The book, How Minds Change, deals with the surprising science of belief, opinion, and persuasion. Keep this in mind for the keynote address by author David McRaney on Tuesday, November 7th, from 7 to 8.30 in Shannon Hall at the Memorial Union. Also for members of the SMPH community, copies of the book are available in Ebeling Library. Well, it was my great pleasure tonight to introduce a colleague, a research collaborator, and a friend of mine. Dr. Ajay Sethi is Professor of Population Health Sciences and also the faculty director of our MPH program. Dr. Sethi's research in interests lie broadly in the realm of infectious diseases. His studies aim to identify modifiable behavioral and structural factors associated with transmission and with morbidity and mortality if infection is established. He works in the area of HIV AIDS, COVID-19, 
healthcare associated infections, the microbiome, and addressing public health misinformation. In 2021, Dr. Sethi received a Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award. He earned his PhD in epidemiology and his MHS in molecular microbiology and immunology from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He also received his uh, bachelor's in physi or physiology from the University of Maryland at College Park. Well, Dr. Sethi is almost synonymous with information, but I mean this in only the best way. He has been an outspoken source of reason on misinformation and conspiracy. He teaches a class on conspiracies in public health. And a wonderful quote here is my class, Conspiracies in Public Health, was first taught in 2018. I saw disinformation and misinformation in medicine and public health as an increasingly alarming issue. The pandemic validated my feelings, but I take no solace in that. Well, before we get to his presentation, a couple things to uh, run past you quick. First of all, our disclosures, the steering committee and presenters have no financial relationships that would uh, need to be disclosed here. Also, for the first time, we are able to offer continuing education credit for this series. At the end of the question and answer period, we will share a code that you can text to 608-260-7097 to mark your attendance and earn continuing education credit. You will receive a confirmation email with a link to an evaluation. Your feedback on that evaluation will be wonderful for us for future sessions of Hot Topics in Public Health. Finally, our learning objectives for tonight include the following. Implement best practices to communicate with individuals across the divides of misinformation. Describe the social and cultural context of misinformation and disinformation. And explain the ramifications of misinformation and disinformation in public health. So without further ado, I turn the stage over to Dr. Sethi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tempty, uh, for that uh, very kind introduction uh, and giving me the opportunity to speak about this topic in this forum. Uh, and thank you everyone who's attending for attending. I do feel uh, obligated to, to start by just disclosing that I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a communications researcher. I'm not a clinician. I don't work in the public health sector. And I certainly do admire people who serve patients and communities having conversations about health and health decision-making, about prevention, you know, on a daily basis. Um, so, you know, thank you for doing that, uh, helping people in our communities being healthier and safer. Um, I wanna start by just saying, you know, I was a graduate student in 1998 when the Lancet paper published by uh, um, and Andrew Wakefield, which has now obviously been retracted, you know, had been published and it implied a, a false connection between MMR vaccine and autism. And in the years that followed, you know, I witnessed my professors, my classmates pivot their interests, their research uh, into areas following sort of this supposed connection between MMR and autism. And I saw it as being so disruptive uh, to people I knew uh, and, and to the institution where I trained. Uh, and, and it was just a little, you know, scary at the time. Um, and after my PhD, it became clear, uh, you know, over a decade later, as a result of years of investigative journalism by Brian Deere, that the Wakefield study the entire time was an elaborate fraud. You know, it was committed by him and a team of lawyers who were trying to bring down MMR vaccine for personal gain. And when I first learned of that, it made me very angry and it just made me think back about all my professors and classmates who were chasing this red herring, despite 
obvious evidence that there was no connection between you know, the vaccine and autism. And I reflect back on that and think this just may very well be the most expensive consequential example of scientific misconduct in history. Um, and it's just something that I, you know, I, I, I try to convert that or trans, translate that sort of anger into something productive. And hence, uh, the class conspiracies in public health was born uh, and, and trying to make sense of misinformation and disinformation in our society figuring out sort of ways in which we can try to reduce its impacts. Now, to start, um, let me just start with a solution. To reduce misinformation and its impacts, you know, this is just not my opinion, but the opinion of many credible people. Uh, you know, we need buy-in for, and, and for this and implementation of a multifaceted coordinated response between international bodies, federal, state, local agencies and organizations, the private sector, and all of this has to be embraced by people across communities. Now, obviously, uh, this is gonna, there are a few barriers to actually achieving uh, this, sort of, uh, this sort of thing, to have this realized. Um, now, in August 2021, during some of the heights of the COVID-19 pandemic, when misinformation was circulating perhaps at, at its peak, uh, you know, the U.S. Surgeon General had an advisory report on building a healthy information environment. And in that report, health mis misinformation is defined. And in that definition, I think the key part is the best available evidence at the time, as Dr. Tempty pointed out so clearly with the quote of the rural health officer in Wisconsin, reflecting on how information was changing so rapidly during sometimes the early periods of the pandemic. And it's a good reminder that indeed, scientific evidence does change. It, it definitely will change frequently when we're confronted with something that's just never been studied before. So our own patience uh, is needed. Now, disinformation is considered misinformation that's spread deliberately. And I think that's a, an easy definition to comprehend. It can be sometimes challenging to identify disinformation when we're confronted by misinformation. Uh, and, and I'll leave it there for now. Now, perhaps one of the more outlandish claims that emerged at the start of the pandemic was that 5G was spreading COVID-19. And on the left there, you see a figure. Dr. Nusosi at Boston University had led a, a research team to examine Google, Google Trends data to characterize the spread of COVID-19 misinformation across eight countries. And they found this exponential increase in the interest uh, in this topic. And at that time, people were climbing 5G towers and setting ablaze the hardware uh, in, these, in these towers. Now recognize that long before COVID, many people in society were against the rollout of 5G networks and 4G before that and 3G before that. Some people believe that any new communication network will give governments new sophisticated ways to spy on citizens. And this is similar to the concern about supposed microchips in vaccines, that conspiracy. Now, many people also believe that electromagnetic waves or any kind of form of radiation will have impacts on health. And that knowledge is known by governments, it's known by cell phone manufacturers and being kept uh, from the public uh, for these nefarious purposes. So these, these sort of fears have been prevalent long before COVID and I kind of see COVID once when it became a 24 seven topic, um, talked about health subject that, that 5G fears essentially attached itself early in the pandemic when we had some of the greatest uncertainty on what was causing this new illness. The WHO had campaigns to dispel this myth, uh, 5G and COVID and other campaigns as well. So for example, drinking methanol, ethanol or bleach does not prevent or cure COVID-19 and can be severe, uh, extremely dangerous. So you may be asking, who would do that? Well, people were actually drinking those fluids, those kinds of chemicals during some parts of the pandemic. And you may have read in the news this week about a man and his three sons being sentenced to prison for operating a business that was disguised as a church and sold more than $1 million worth of industrial bleach solution that they had claimed was a miracle cure for COVID-19, for Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, HIV, 
uh, leukemia, other, other illnesses. Now, what I found interesting was that that company uh, was actually formed before the pandemic in 2019. And when, when COVID emerged, their profits suddenly uh, rose. And unfortunately, and very sadly, thousands of people were poisoned, um, uh, demonstrating just a real consequence to misinformation, especially when the source is the deliberate spread of, of um, misinformation. Now, other myths that had emerged uh, that the WHO was trying to tackle, you know, was related to antiseptics, uh, the consumption of garlic, uh, mosquitoes transmitting the virus. Um, and, you know, this is just really a sample of the kinds of myths that had been circulating and still some do circulate uh, to this day. And when I think about all the misinformation and disinformation that has been spread, still spreading, it does sort of help me to put into context all of this uh, into, into some sort of sense of history or, or to think about the historical context of pandemics and crises in general. So perhaps, you know, it should not be surprising uh, to anybody that there was also a great deal of misinformation circulating uh, during the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. World War I uh, had ended in around 1918 and there was a lot of anti-German sentiment <clears throat> in the U.S. and around the world. There was a great deal of suspicion towards the company Bayer, uh, manufacturers of aspirin, and that's a German company. The U.S. manufacturing plant of Bayer made a point in their advertisement, you can see there on the left, uh, stating that the pills of aspirin were made on the banks of the Hudson River, right? An American product. Um, on the right, you see a Brazilian newspaper cartoon uh, showing a German submarine using uh, Spanish flu as a weapon of war. There are syringes attached to this uh, submarine. Now, presently, we're in the seventh pandemic of cholera. Uh, there have been seven uh, recognized pandemics of this disease. And the first one uh, had occurred 1817 to 1824. Uh, in India, uh, when India was controlled by the British. Now, cholera itself uh, is an endemic uh, bacteria that's present, was present in India and other parts of the world. And there had not been a recognized pandemic uh, until this time. Um, it was during this time of colonization that it began to spread across the country and region uh, and, and eventually everywhere. Now, Europeans and the British associated the disease with pilgrimages, ritual practices, religious rituals, uh, and, and they felt, in a sense, that was contributing to xenophobia and racism that was already present. Uh, now, in colonized India, Indians associated the spread of cholera across uh, their country uh, with the movement of British troops, uh, who were certainly more mobile than Indians uh, in India and in, in the region. Uh, and so certainly any movement of people can spread infectious diseases, but the perspectives are different depending on which one you take. Now, British historian David Arnold uh, wrote uh, this, which I, I, I thought was useful. Uh, like any other disease, cholera has no intrinsic meaning, uh, but in 19th century India, it acquired enormous meaning and significance from its various cultural and political contexts. He also writes, the Indian origins of cholera and its almost global dissemination from Bengal made the disease a convenient symbol for much that the West feared or despised about a society so different from its own. And I think about this example of history and reflect on the xenophobia that emerged after SARS-CoV-2 became pandemic uh, and the kinds of people who fuel those kinds of racist and xenophobic sentiments and realize that while it's shocking and startling and unfortunate, it's also almost human nature for this to occur during times of crises. Now, just to put into context, uh, this sort of timeline you see there on the left of the seven pandemics, uh, germ theory was established in the 1860s, so after the first cholera pandemic. The actual bacteria Vibrio cholera was discovered twice, uh, first in Italy in 1854, and then again by Robert Koch in India in 1883. And as an epidemiologist, I feel obligated to say John Snow was investigating cholera outbreaks in London in the 1850s. 
So this was a time of lots of uncertainty, lots of new scientific discoveries, um, lots of information that was being processed. And this was pre-internet. So it took maybe a little while and there was probably, I imagine, lots of misinformation that was being spread at the time. Those two little images you see on the slide on the left is a cartoon, uh, a German engraving actually, of a woman who is wearing all the known cures of cholera that, uh, you know, sort of remedies that people were telling uh, others about. Uh, and on the right is a picture of death, uh, you know, uh, taking the lives of people who are going on pilgrimages uh, and, and spreading cholera. Again, this was the sentiment at the time. Let me sort of now uh, sort of pivot to uh, sort of factors that I see as contributing to the adoption and spread of misinformation. And I think on the top of this list certainly is going to be mistrust of people or organizations in positions of authority. Now, I do want to distinguish between mistrust, which we think of as a general suspicion towards others or organizations, versus distrust, a word that ought to be used or can be used when somebody is actually, when that mistrust is based on an actual experience um, with an organization or with people in positions of power. So just like we distinguish disinformation and misinformation, we can distinguish distrust and mistrust. So let's look, let's look at some examples of when mistrust in health interventions uh, you know, might originate or maybe be reinforced. And this is just sort of a sample of, of some. Uh, so I, I begin with listing four sort of major catastrophes, crises of what I call failures, failures in public health, failures in medicine, failures in government. Uh, and you can look at some of these uh, and, and recognize, you know, what it might be like to be a citizen in Flint, Michigan, and suddenly your water is no longer, municipal water is no longer uh, consumable, it's poisoned uh, with lead, what you might feel, what kind of trust you may have in government moving forward, what kind of mistrust was reinforced because of this event. Uh, you might think that this is just a way to sell bottled water, something that we really don't need in our society when we, our municipal water is safe, uh, and what a tragedy this is. Um, you can look at some of the other ones, Tuskegee has been uh, well described and, and unfortunate that people were denied treatment for syphilis for decades. Uh, I see that as a complete failure. We, we, would, we should know better. The doctors should have known better. Uh, the Gold King mine wastewater spill occurred in Colorado in 2015, an EPA cleanup of an old abandoned private mine, uh, the Gold King mine. Um, some contractors accidentally caused a dam to break. Three million gallons of wastewater contaminated with heavy metals spilling into an Animus River watershed. Um, and local municipalities, Navajo Nation, suddenly have water that's contaminated with heavy metals. It's now a Superfund site. There are also examples of sort of failures where we probably did not know better at the time. And so I classify these maybe as unintended consequences. And before we had knowledge of bloodborne viruses or hepatitis C and specifically, you may know that Egypt has uh, the highest prevalence of hepatitis C in the world. And this is because of uh, large mass campaigns, mass treatment campaigns to treat schistosomiasis that was prevalent in the country with prosequantil, which is given by injection. And this was an era where it was common to reuse uh, syringes, in this case, glass syringes and needles. Uh, and so while the, the prevalence of schistosomiasis dropped after these campaigns that began in the 50s and went through even, even the early 80s, uh, it, was, it was quickly realized that there was the unintentional spread of hepatitis C, a real tragedy. But imagine being in Egypt, suffering from hepatitis C and wondering, could this have been prevented, right? Where how is that going to erode trust in government and public health campaigns? Uh, SV40 uh, is, is a virus, simian virus 40, discovered newly uh, and found to be uh, contaminating polio vaccines, particularly uh, inactivated polio vaccines used in the 1950s. Um, 
And people, you know, weren't as upset about the contamination since it was a new discovery. I think what people became upset about was that after knowledge of that virus, uh, our government continued to vaccinate people with contaminated polio vaccine under the assumption that it was not associated with human cancers, which eventual evidence did show that it hasn't been related to human cancers. Uh, but that evidence really hadn't emerged at the time, and it, it was very upsetting to people that there was a continued use of this. And there are estimates that 10 to 30 percent of the 98 million shots administered during that period uh, between 1955 and 1963 were, was contaminated with SV40. Uh, and although it doesn't seem to have any causal relationships between uh, that virus and cancers in humans, it certainly does upset people, and it's understandable. Now, here I'm going to classify some examples of mistrust, and these were actual conspiracies, just bona fide conspiracies. And, and on top of the list, I have Operation Infection. You may have heard, maybe by a different name, or you just have, you know that the that the Russian government through the KGB in the 1980s planted the idea around the world, and particularly in the U.S., that the U.S. government had invented the HIV AIDS virus. And it was, a, it was part of a biological weapons research project. And unfortunately, this disinformation campaign, which the KGB and the Russian government have admitted to, in fact, at the start of the COVID pandemic, there were jokes made by Russian officials that maybe we should do Operation Infection 2. Um, because infection one was very successful and it still sticks, particularly among black people in the United States who then and still somewhat now see that virus as being man-made and a form of genocide against uh, people who are black. Um, people in general, uh, I, I already covered Wakefield's conflict of interest and falsified data. For Merck, you know, we know that people are suspicious of quote, big pharma. Um, and those individuals certainly, you know, will cite all sorts of reasons for distrusting or mistrusting Big Pharma, but they can actually cite Merck's admission of withholding information on the adverse events related to Biox, a painkiller, that was eventually pulled from the market, but Merck had knowledge about the adverse events and did not share that with, uh, share that widely. Um, and during that time, they had made $2 billion in profit and the fines for not sharing that information is minuscule compared to the profits that they had made. This certainly can rub people the wrong way and not, not it certainly reinforces the already mistrust that people have with large companies. Uh, Operation Neptune Spear, you may have heard also, uh, is subject of the movie Zero Dark Thirty, uh, was, was um, uh, the, the mission conducted by the CIA, CIA to capture Osama bin Laden. And in order to do reconnaissance, to, to understand where he was living in the compound he was uh, living in, uh, the CIA set up a fake hepatitis B vaccine campaign. In the aftermath of the capture of Osama bin Laden, capture and killing of him, uh, can you imagine being a citizen in Abbottabad, Pakistan, sort of wondering, is this next public health campaign for vaccination, is it real or is it a CIA plot? Uh, and this is an actual conspiracy that occurred and it really has hampered polio eradication efforts to this day uh, in that part of the world and other countries as well. And we should, we should own up to these sort of uh, unintended consequences of conspiracies. Now, getting back to our sort of list of factors that contribute to mistrust, there are people, um, and it's, it's somewhat understandable sometimes, uh, in some situations, who have just an internal conflict with the notion of public health policy, the notion of having policies for the greater good at the expense of individual decisions to make uh, choices about their health. And this has clearly been a topic during the COVID pandemic. Now, in case you don't know, you know, the 10th Amendment to the Constitution is what affords states the power to establish and enforce laws protecting uh, citizens of the state, uh, welfare, safety, and the health of the public, so public health. And in the early 1900s, uh, a person by the name of Henry Jacobson challenged the requirement that he should be vaccinated against smallpox. This, was, this challenge made it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court upheld the right of the state of Massachusetts to have mandatory vaccination of 
and citizens. And that precedence has held itself for the most part to this day, but some of that has eroded in some states during the COVID-19 pandemic when people were challenging states' abilities to mandate vaccines or mandate masks or mandate uh, shutdowns of non-essential businesses. <coughs> I think it's worth mentioning that Jacobson's contention was that he had already been vaccinated in Sweden. He was an immigrant of Sweden. Uh, and before arriving to the US, he had been vaccinated for smallpox during that country's campaign. And he didn't feel like he should get vaccinated again, particularly because he had experienced side effects of the vaccine, uh, as well as members of his family. And he, he had thought there was some hereditary reason for not having a good experience with the vaccine. He challenged, he challenged the, the mandatory nature of the vaccine. And if you think about it, if you had a side effect to a vaccine previously, and you're being told that it doesn't matter, you have to get vaccinated anyway, you would be upset. And so I can actually really empathize with Henning Jacobson at the time. But this was also a period when, you know, we didn't have a lot of regulation related to public health. This was sort of the start of the public health era of the of the 20th century. And I think it's it's better uh, described by historian Michael Werwich of uh, Brandeis University. So at the turn of the 20th century, you know, there was little to no regulation governing the pharmaceutical industry. And many people were sort of forced to receive vaccines and most of them against their will. He writes in his book, Pox in American History, this, and, and he also did an interview in 2011 uh, with Terry Gross of Fresh Air of NPR. And it's, it's worth looking up and listening to the whole thing if you haven't uh, already done that previously. Uh, so a 1901 smallpox vaccination rate in New York City. And he writes sort of 250 men arrived at a little Italy tenement house in the middle of the night and set about vaccinating everyone they could find. And he's, here, he, here's a quote from him. There were scenes of policemen holding down men in their night robes while vaccinators began their work on their arms. Inspectors were going room to room looking for children with smallpox. And when they found them, they were literally tearing babies from their mother's arms to take them to the city pest house. Uh, and pest houses were housing smallpox victims. There was one episode in Middlesbrough, Kentucky, where the police and a group of vaccinators went into this African-American section of town, rounded up people outside this home, handcuffed the men and women, and vaccinated them at gunpoint, So says Wilbridge. Uh, it's a shocking scene and very much at odds with our daily held notions of public liberty. Now, this was a long time ago, and I, I bring this up because I think you know, we often hail smallpox vaccination as a real success, success story uh, in public health, and it is. It's eradicated smallpox from uh, this world. But, you know, the campaigns for smallpox vaccine uh, around in this country and around the world are marred by this history that I think we have to just acknowledge. Um, these are people who have passed down uh, through oral history uh, these stories, uh, these attitudes uh, towards public health and towards uh, this kind of these kinds of campaigns to subsequent generations. And so sometimes I, when I reflect on this, I realize, you know, maybe we shouldn't be surprised that people have mistrust because they may have heard this through their families, not maybe totally identify how and why, but it's something that persists across generations. Now for the next uh, uh, several factors, these are all sort of uh, uh, psychological factors mainly. And I'm not gonna provide specific examples of these contributors of uh, you know, the adoption and spread of misinformation. But I do encourage you to read David McCraney's book, How Minds Change. And I, I'm almost done with it myself and I have found it to be very compelling. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just say that during very emotional moments and times in society, it is easy for all of us to just feel scared and sort of a, a loss of control in general. And when there is an information vacuum, like we saw in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, it can be almost like a reflex to fill that void with information that just simply feels familiar to us. You know, what feels comforting? Uh, we don't know, you know, we don't know what we don't know. 
and sometimes the information that we are incorporating into our worldview turns out to be misinformation. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes that misinformation was given to you deliberately uh, to take advantage of your heightened fears and anxieties, or I should say our heightened fears and anxieties. It's something that I think we all experience at different times in our life. These, these situations don't have to be related to an infectious disease or a pandemic. Think about financial uncertainty. Uh, it certainly can be scary, the loss of relationships. Uh, these are all highly emotional situations we can face at any, any time. Now, human beings in general, uh, we all want to keep things simple. Our brains are wired to reduce complex phenomenon into bins or into dichotomized points of view. Uh, you know, we use heuristics, honestly, to our advantage. These cognitive shortcuts help us make decisions and navigate our daily lives uh, without expending too much energy. Uh, it, and it's natural to, for those cognitive shortcuts, unfortunately, to form biases or maybe implicit biases. And it's very important that we're aware of these implicit biases and, and try to reduce their presence and their effects. So there's positives and negatives to these shortcuts. Uh, you know, often I say our, po our politics feels quite polarized, but if anyone were to have, you know, real honest conversations with people across the entire political spectrum, it probably will turn out that there is a wide range of overlapping values and beliefs, uh, and, and we're, we may not be as polarized as we think, but it can be, again, comforting to reduce very complex uh, things like people's political views into uh, you know, two parties, which one do you belong to? Uh, and it's also human nature to surround ourselves with like-minded people uh, and information that's consistent with how we think about the world ourselves. Uh, it's, it's a protective behavior. It's instinctive to place ourselves sort of into these bubbles um, a, a, a that way. And it's, it's, it's an urge that I think it's, it's important for us to try to resist so that we can try to remain as objective when confronted with new knowledge or new information. Now, I think we can all agree there's different forms of evidence, um, and, and whether that's scientific evidence, uh, evidence from observation, uh, you know, legal evidence, we should acknowledge that, you know, personal experience, regardless of what a researcher or scientist or scientific consensus might say, personal experience often supersedes uh, objective reasoning. Um, imagine sort of being the recipient of, um, you know, a, an unwanted medical bill. Um, imagine what you'd feel after that and what, how you're going to think about navigating the healthcare system from that point forward. Whether that was a mistake or not, it does sort of change the way you uh, navigate decision making moving forward related to accessing healthcare. Now, maladaptive coping and psychological vulnerability, again, is something we're all capable of, of having. Uh, and I think it's really demonstrated well by another historical example. And I'm going to bring up AIDS denialism, uh, which was very prominent in the years that followed the discovery of the HIV virus. And it still persists today at low levels uh, related to HIV AIDS. But denialism certainly is very common in general. Um, so pictured on the left are six scientists who were AIDS denialists. They denied that HIV was a cause of AIDS. And perhaps the most famous is Peter Duisburg in the top left, a renowned scientist at the time, very, very you know, well known uh, in his research, but began to promote the idea that HIV uh, is a, uh, was actually like a passenger virus, that AIDS was actually caused by his views, recreational and uh, drugs and pharmaceutical drugs. Completely wrong, but maybe ideologically driven. And he spent the rest of his career uh, and still does, promoting this sort of false belief. Now, right below uh, uh, Peter Duisburg is Kerry Mullis, uh, and you may know him. He also became an AIDS denialist. Mullis received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, for inventing PCR. PCR is used to measure HIV viral load. It obviously was used to measure the presence of SARS-CoV-2 in samples. Uh, he, he somehow became an AIDS denialist and began promoting, again, that view that HIV doesn't cause AIDS. And other people pictured here are biochemists, molecular biologists, evolutionary biologists, 
pathologists. I mean, they're people with really good careers, illustrious careers. Now, sadly, Duisburg and just AIDS denialism in general, you know, spilled over uh, into the minds and hearts of people who have to make decisions for themselves and for populations. So on the top right is South African President Thabo Mbeki, who was president from 1999 to 2008. Uh, who at the time needed to consider how to provide antiviral therapy to South Africans with HIV. Uh, new therapies were available, they were life-saving, uh, and somehow Duisburg found a way to whisper into the ear of Thabo and Becky, uh, who then began to use Duisburg's philosophy and teachings uh, as a reason to deny people in South Africa life-saving treatment. And there's been modeling done to care to estimate how many lives were lost because of the delay in providing therapy to South Africans. Eventually he did realize that Duisburg was wrong and therapy became available, but the damage was already done. On the bottom right, Christine Maguire uh, is also a very sad story. Uh, she was pregnant uh, and, and she really took in to the very idea that HIV may not be real. Uh, she refused antiviral therapy during pregnancy uh, unfortunately, her daughter became infected, but she refused to test her, uh, also remained untreated. Uh, both mom and daughter died eventually. Uh, Maggie Orr, uh, she formed this organization called Alive and Well AIDS Alternatives, very popular, was able to get a lot of fundraising. And it was an organization that disputed the link between HIV and AIDS. And it was its mission was to urge HIV positive pregnant women to avoid treatment. Uh, again, extremely sad. And another example of how disinformation or misinformation, in this case, specifically AIDS denialism, can cause so much loss of life. Um, on the right are some quotes from social psychologist Seth Kalishman, which I find useful here. He writes, um, a paradox of AIDS denialism is that while its message is completely detached from the objective reality of AIDS, it can be quite convincing AIDS denialists rely on well-defined tactics to confuse people about the cause of AIDS and persuade them to ignore medical consensus on prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. Strategies used by AIDS denialists uh, include uh, morphing science, cherry picking, and single study fallacy. And I think we can all agree, we, we are seeing that uh, related to COVID-19. History certainly is repeating itself. Um, sort of back to my list, uh, the last one I'll cover is susceptibility to the motives of doubt creators. Uh, and I'll give this, again, classic historical example of the tobacco industry and their well-orchestrated methods to create doubt in the public about the health effects of smoking, despite there being growing evidence at the time that smoking was a cause of lung cancer. And this advertisement, a frank uh, statement uh, to cigarette smokers was designed as part of an elaborate campaign to make tobacco companies appear to appear more like responsible to their consumers. They wanted to show concern for the health of their consumers, but in reality, they were promoting the belief that smoking did not have any health risks. And their aim was to protect their own image, make them look like the good guys, while promoting an, sort of an all-American individualism attitude towards the right to smoke. And I ask you, does that sound familiar when we think about mass debates or when we think about vaccination debates today? Now, one uh, a statistician, Sir Ronald Fisher, you may know this name if you've performed the Fisher exact test or other methods that he had developed, you know, for some reason was really swept up in this moment. Now he was a smoker, but many men at his, of his age were smokers at the time. So I don't think that was necessarily the, the source of bias, but he would use cherry picking and single study fallacies to find fault in the studies demonstrating the health effects of smoking. And in a sense, he lost all objectivity. Uh, and it was rather odd for someone who you know, spent his entire career developing modern statistical methods. Um, he, he held on to his ideological objections, which he had also revealed you know, as he talked about this, his objections uh, to, in general, mass public health campaigns. Um, again, going back to that internal conflict that some people have with the very notion of public health. Now, some of you might have read Merchants of Doubt, uh, a book written in 2010 by uh, science historians 
uh, Oreskes and Conway. And they did a nice job identifying parallels between the doubts that people have had over the years about whether climate change, global warming is real uh, and the same tactics used to spread misinformation by the tobacco industry. And they describe in their book this idea that if you keep the controversy alive by spreading doubt and confusion after scientific consensus has been reached, this is a strategy to oppose any kind of action from being taken. Uh, and they showed that how a few contrarian scientists when joining forces with organizations aiming to oppose action can have major, major impacts. It doesn't take a lot of people to mobilize a movement that has a terrible impact. Now, today we know that sowing the seeds of doubt and discord are done rather efficiently. Uh, they're done in social media through bots and trolls. Uh, foreign governments create this, private citizens create these. Um, our government probably creates these. Uh, and I, I, I do worry sometimes where I think about how artificial intelligence may proliferate. Uh, the use of uh, you know, bots, trolls, other means to sow more seeds of doubt, how fast this will become and what kind of challenge this may be around the corner. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about COVID-19. And so I want to just comment on when credentialed individuals, uh, influential people, you know, become, become um, sort of part of a disinformation machine that exists in our society. Now, on the right, uh, you might have seen this, a grid of 12 people uh, deemed the disinformation dozen. The Center for Countering Digital Hate estimated in 2021 that these 12 people uh, were producing 65% of the share of anti-vaccine misinformation on social media platforms. Uh, you know, they were profiting from the spread of this misinformation. And frankly, they've been profiting of the, uh, over, profiting off the spread of misinformation long before COVID. Uh, and if you get on one of these websites uh, and do it at your own risk, I can say that I've lost sleep over the over the years, getting immersed in these websites, just mesmerized and how, how wild they are and what the kinds of claims they make. They strategically juxtapose dubious information with information that's actually quite right on target so that it has some legitimacy, but you get sucked into various products that they're selling uh, related to health, aging, cancer, wellness, uh, all sorts of books, uh, lots of things. They're on every social media outlet. On the left, some of these faces may be familiar to you. On the left, I say is sort of, these are representatives of a newer generation of credentialed people who are also taken in by the, the industry that's out there to spread misinformation. Some of these people have political appointees. There are political appointees. Many of them are healthcare professionals. Among the disinformation dozens, six of those people out of 12 are healthcare providers or were healthcare providers. And if you wander on sort of today's websites, you'll find that they too are selling books, supplements, and interestingly, T-shirts, mugs, uh, you know, slides for my feet. Uh, they're promoting brands. Uh, the medical misinformation that is sort of being spread, it, it, it starts with some kind of bait. Uh, and then somehow you're then led into their other messages. The idea of medical freedom, the idea that the healthcare system is, is flawed, that the FDA is tainted they sort of tug at all the fears that exist in society in order to promote their message. And sometimes what, what has been popular and what has been effective at various times during the pandemic is promoting the use of ivermectin to prevent or treat COVID-19, or hydroxychloroquine, uh, minerals, supplements. And of course, don't forget, you have to get those t-shirts. I'm always amazed how these websites are just two clicks away from looking very, very, very dubious. Uh, they're also selling telehealth appointments, anywhere from $90 to $1,000 per consult. Uh, quite astonishing. Um, this is sort of what we're dealing with right now. Uh, for ivermectin promotion, at one point in 2021, it was estimated that there were $129 million of annual insurance claims, and that's a conservative estimate. I mean, what a waste of resources uh, at, at a time when we should be focusing our energies towards what works. Now, the, I'm gonna uh, click on this. I'm not gonna show a screenshot of any of their websites. I don't think they need the attention, 
Uh, but I, on one of their websites, I scroll down, and sure enough, there's a disclaimer that protects them from liability. And I'll, I'll read parts of this to you. So it says, the information contained or presented on this website is for educational purposes only. Information on this site is not intended to serve as a substitute for diagnosis, treatment, or advice from a qualified licensed medical professional. The facts presented are offered as information only in order to empower you our protocol is not medical advice, and in no way should anyone infer that we, even though we are physicians, <laughs> or anyone appearing in any content on this website are practicing medicine. It is for educational purposes only. I mean, you get the point here. Um, if you read that disclaimer, I, I would hope that most people's reaction is to shut their browser. Um, but this protects them from liability, uh, and, and it's so far down sometimes and embedded on these websites, it's not that different from reading the latest terms of agreement to the app that you're updating on your phone. People rarely read them. Uh, and, and this again, protects them, but it does clearly state that what you're reading is not medical advice. Um, now, the majority of Americans think that doctors who intentionally spread misinformation about COVID-19 uh, should be held accountable. And according to a 2021 poll, uh, conducted by the Morning Consult. Uh, this was on, done on behalf of the DeMobot Foundation. They found that 91% of adults said doctors don't have the right to intentionally spread misinformation or false health information. That 83% said that physicians responsibility, have a responsibility to share credible information with patients. And that the public, I'm sorry, that, that their need to spread credible information to patients outweighs their own interest in protecting right to speech. Uh, the public is pretty clear on this, but it's very challenging uh, to enforce uh, some, of these, uh, some of these things. Now, you might remember the FDA when ivermectin prescriptions were at an all-time high, began this social media campaign, uh, you are not a horse. Um, it's comedic. It got a lot of attention from late night talk show hosts. Um, you know, I sometimes think the comedy is helpful uh, because it it allows people to talk about it, but unfortunately, sometimes it, it normalizes the idea that people are prescribing medications that should not be prescribed. Now, there are attempts. Uh, the state of California last year had passed um, Assembly Bill 2098 that deemed the dissemination of COVID-19 misinformation as unprofessional uh, conduct. Of course, it was challenged. Uh, and before getting to the courts, government, uh, uh, Governor Newsom, just I think earlier in October, repealed the bill, so it's no longer law. Uh, and, you know, honestly, this kind of law is very challenging to pass because if it's written too specifically, it doesn't have broad application. If it's written too broadly, it does encroach on a doctor's ability to be able to have conversations with patients around topics where there is a lot of uncertainty new treatments for cancer, enrolling in a clinical trial. These kinds of topics are very important for doctors to have with their patients, and they don't want to be you know, accused of spreading misinformation, and really they're just providing medicine as it should be practiced. So naturally it was uh, you know, challenged and it has been repealed, but I do wanna just mention this because people do are trying to work on this issue at the high levels of government. Now back to uh, the Surgeon General's advisory. Here's a table of contents on the right and you can see there's advice on how people can address health misinformation, ranging from uh, governments down to individuals. And on the left, I have a picture of a sociologic framework, which I think is a useful model to think about how misinfa misinformation spreads through all of these concentric circles and how we can rely on a multi-pronged approach um, to try to address misinformation. And as I said, governments are trying to do this, communities are trying to do this, institutions are trying to do this. It's a challenging issue. I wanna spend the last bits of my talk to focus on what we as individuals can do, because I think that's what we can control. Uh, and I think we're obviously in positions all the time to address misinformation among friends, family, loved ones, colleagues, uh, and on ourselves. So one, I wanna say, never ignore misinformation when doing so can result in harm to an individual. There may be that 911 moment where you need to act. In sort of non-acute situations, I think it's important to have really high levels of self and situational awareness. 
do a self-assessment of your sort of present emotional health. Um, it's challenging to have these conversations. And I think if a conversation with a family member about a topic that, you know, you have different points of view, if it's going to lead to an argument or somebody's, you know, high blood pressure, it's not worth having because you may never have another conversation about that topic again for that reason. Um, so it's good to sort of be in the right state of mind. It's also good to arm yourself with, uh, you know, what are the popular and less popular types of misinformation that's floating out there. Uh, as challenging it is to get on these websites and read about it, uh, it's a good idea to do that. And then there's also practical skills. And I have a list of many sort of things in my conspiracies in public health class. Uh, I include content that draws on skills from motivational interviewing, risk communication, active listening, uh, crisis counseling, the idea of validating people's uh, concerns and fears and emotions is very important. I think we can also be better at counterfactual thinking. Don't take information at face value. Ask ourselves, what disconfirming information do I need before drawing a conclusion? Uh, we all need to be better at using plain language so our conversations can be simpler and more, maybe, maybe even more engaging and less distancing. Um, it's using the word efficacy in a conversation is not going to be very helpful when talking about vaccines. We can just say, you know, how well vaccines work. Storytelling can be very powerful. And if you've ever taken an improv class, you know that a basic tenet of improv is yes and. This is how you keep conversations going. If you have a conversation where you're constantly refuting what somebody is saying, that's not going to endure. And then finally, I think it's important that we practice some detachment and mindfulness. These can be challenging conversations to have. And sometimes you just need to be divorced from the emotion and just focus on active listening um, and, and, and in order to really help someone. And, you know, also, I want to say it's important that we feel empathy for people uh, who have misinformation, um, especially because we too are capable of being misinformed and we would want others to have empathy for our uh, errors in thinking. Uh, get to know where people are coming from. Imperative that we establish trust and never assume uh, that you have it. Uh, identify shared interests and values. That can be a good launching point into a conversation. Uh, seek out credible sources of information, but always avoid thinking that education is what somebody needs, that is the immediate solution. I always say it's people are perfectly capable of searching the internet and finding themselves on websites with correct information. Why people may get sort of baited and, and go to websites with more dubious information is what we need to address. What are their fears? What are their anxieties? What are our own fears and anxieties that cause us to adopt misinformation? Finally, uh, also changing someone's mind is not the goal of a conversation. And I think uh, going back to David McCraney's book, uh, I encourage you to read that. Um, our goals of, of a conversation really ought to be to have a relationship, to build trust, and to have a conversation again another day. Really important that we know how to say, I don't know. Um, when you lead with uncertainty, uh, as Dr. Tempty had mentioned, um, you know, we, we become more credible suddenly. Nobody wants a salesy pitch as to why they should think of a vaccine as safe if they have concerns. And that's it. Uh, I'm going to leave it as that. And, uh, and, and thank you again for listening. And I look forward to uh, John talking to you about some of the questions that had come in. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sethi. This was a wonderful overview. And I know that you try to condense into 50 minutes normally what you do over a semester in, in class. So uh, so I'm going to start with a question that, that you haven't seen before. And this might be unfair. But in this whole realm, what gives you hope for improvements in information flow? Improvements in information flow? Yeah, I mean, it's fast paced. Information changes constantly. And where I find hope is when somebody, you know, who previously may have adopted some misinformed views, change their mind. Um, it gives me an idea that, you know, there, there actually really is the ability for people to, to, to change their mind. I think we just have to do more listening to find out what it is that concerns them. 
uh, and, and rather than ignore um, somebody who's misinformed or label them or stereotype them to actually have an honest conversation. They do happen. They happen between doctor and patient, public health workers and the community. We don't hear about them very much, but they do happen. And I imagine you have some success stories as well with your patients. Yeah, and I have to relate back to uh, your tenant uh, presented near the, near the end of one conversation at a time. That uh, unfortunately, it seems that misinformation can occur in a broadcast form. Uh, and often, often correcting that narrative is <clears throat> on a one-by-one -one basis. So uh, definitely challenges out there. So when we look at consequences of misinformation, uh, you, you brought out and you started out with the whole issue of MMR vaccine or measles vaccine and autism. But what, what do you perceive as the biggest barrier to overcome with vaccine hesitancy? Yeah, I'll say that it is very hard to convince someone to protect themselves against something that they haven't personally experienced. And it can be maybe easier to convince someone to pursue treatment for a disease for which the symptoms are debilitating, difficult, and is actually what leads people to seek healthcare. Uh, people will swallow a pill if, it, if they think it's gonna make them feel better because they understand why they're taking it. Adherence may actually be also very good. Vaccines is challenging. Uh, if you haven't, if you have, if we haven't seen measles in the community, uh, if if you haven't seen the suffering related to vaccine prevented prevention preventative diseases, uh, it can be hard to convince yourself that this is what you need. You have to perceive the risk to be high, and if the disease is not prevalent, perceived threat as well. I'll also just comment that there, people make you know evaluations of what is the perceived threat of the vaccine, what's the perceived threat of the disease. And when you haven't seen the disease, suddenly the concerns about safety are heightened, even though the FDA and advisors such as yourself have already deemed that the benefits far outweigh the risk. People don't hear that. No, it's so very true. And, and your, uh, your slide dealing with uh, smallpox and the forced uh, uh, immunization is very striking. And by way of full disclosure, Above my left shoulder is a frame certificate from 1792 of burialization of two children signed by the overseer or overseer of the poor in Boston, Massachusetts. So uh, th this is part and parcel of our culture. And when you bring up uh, issues, you know, from uh, forced vaccination to the Tuskegee uh, study to other issues. I, I think it's really imperative for uh, those of us in public health and medicine to understand the ramifications of the past and how that kind of contributes to the historic narrative from which people derive some of the hesitation uh, that we see out there. Okay, um, we had the benefit of a great number of questions coming in uh, up front. Uh, one other question pertaining to consequences of misinformation is, goes like this, why have healthcare institutions caved into the anti-mask contingent and removed masking requirements from all who enter the facilities? It was proven based on the low incidence of influenza in the early part of the pandemic, the masking worked to reduce several types of communicable disease. Yeah, I mean, it's a complex question, and I totally recognize that many people see mask use as continued, as, as being useful uh, in healthcare settings. I'll also say that any policy is only useful if people follow it, and if people are willing to sustain mask use. I'm not a decision maker in those settings, and I'm thankful for that. And I, I, but I imagine a lot of things are weighed, considering what the adherence might be like, the costs of masks, um, how that might interfere with patient care. It's a polarizing topic. I don't know if they've caved necessarily. I think we can also say 
we are in a very different point in the pandemic today than we were in the beginning. There is a lot of immunity out there. People who are at high risk for severe COVID ought to continue to wear a mask in situations where there's a risk of acquiring the virus. Others are taking a risk. It's a calculated risk. Um, I also say that since mask use widely has dissipated, we don't really quite see the same kinds of unexpected surges of COVID like we did in the beginning of the pandemic when there was no immunity. The immunity is doing something. Uh, despite there being very little mitigation, and it will only get better. And I, I think that really plays off of this whole area of scientific uncertainty. Um, if I look at studies performed throughout the pandemic, uh, it was hard to come up with any conclusive information on the benefit of masking. And we didn't have the benefit of randomized controlled trials. Uh, we didn't have the standard of evidence. So this goes back to this whole idea of science leading with uncertainty, that we always take a very hesitant uh, standpoint. And would you be willing to comment on the conflict between a scientific method where we're very, very cautious and people who will step out and say, absolutely, I'm right. There's no question about this. Uh, and I can never be wrong. Uh, and you have this dichotomy in the public sphere all the time. And how do we best approach that? Yeah, one, I never follow the opinion of one person uh, when they talk about new science that has emerged, even if it's their own research or other people's research. I like to hear many voices and I am indeed drawn to people who lead with some measure of uncertainty. I feel like they're having a more nuanced interpretation of what they're reading. Uh, some people are also willing to say, I don't know, more readily than others. And again, I, I, I am sometimes turned off when I feel somebody's trying to sell me something. Uh, it doesn't have to be a car, but it might be somebody's research findings. And, and that's usually a sign that they may be more bought into it than the public could be. Um, I like to see things play out a little longer and wait for more consensus to develop, uh, especially if the action that needs to be taken from the new discovery isn't immediate. We can actually maybe wait a little longer for more information to emerge. So another question deals with, <clears throat> is there a difference in response to information, uh, be it truthful or disinformation coming from government versus coming from industry? Yeah, you know, okay, so we we are politically polarized, even though I try to make the claim that our, our values and our beliefs in society have a lot more overlap between our two parties. There is a tendency, you know, for one side to be more suspicious of the government and the other side to be more suspicious of corporations. And again, I think it's, and some people are suspicious of everybody, you know, I think, um, it's unfortunate. I did go through a lot of examples where governments, industry, people, organizations, uh, the church, all sorts of people in powerful positions who have lied to the public or have done things that are nefarious. It's part of our history. We should own it. At the same time, I'll, I'll pick on Big Pharma, for example. People might complain about the potential profits that a drug maker could make from medication. But I'll also ask, what, we're, what are we going to do? We, this is the system we live in. We, li we, we need drug companies to make drugs. What we actually need is maybe more regulation, and more oversight. Um, you know, that's what we should be asking for. We shouldn't be canceling drug manufacturing in this country. We shouldn't be canceling local public health agencies. We should actually work with the communities, work with people to try to have better solutions. Where I do feel like we can become maybe angry is when people have obvious conflicts of interest and they are giving me information that's incorrect in order to, you know, buy another narrative that they're selling. We have a recent uh, question coming in from Kate Schultz. Do you have any special comments or strategies for dealing with mis 
information or disinformation on social media, which can be shared so quickly and rarely verified before? Yeah, I'll, yeah, I, it's a good question, and it's complicated, of course. Uh, social media companies were, you know, filtering COVID misinformation during the heights of the pandemic. A lot of them have pulled back on that, um, in the spirit of uh, freedom of speech, and this is what makes it so complicated. I think social media companies, everybody bears a responsibility. I don't think censorship is the right answer. Uh, it's going to be met with a lot of resistance. And you don't want to suddenly censor things that shouldn't be censored. Uh, I think there are lines that can be drawn related to hate, for example, hate speech. But I do think a lot of things fall into this gray area. And as I showed in that sociological model, the responsibility is not only on social media companies or governments or people in institutions. Individuals can also be better at social media use. I think sometimes we should maybe not use social media as much or use it with the intention of finding information rather than having them become the source of our information, whether we like it or not. You know, it's, it's sort of, um, these are practices I think we had to teach in childhood, frankly, is how to be good consumers of media, particularly social media. Well, I'm gonna, I have too many good questions here, but I'm gonna finish up uh, with one here in the interest of time. Uh, but this came in earlier. What are some of the things that public health workers can do to eliminate uh, politicization of outbreaks and of public health in general? Yeah, I'll say, I think it's important that we recognize that, okay, so things have been politicized with the COVID pandemic, but public health has to work with politicians. This is where the funding comes from uh, in order to operate public health, how new programs can start. So we shouldn't avoid politics. Uh, if anything, I think we need to embrace the political spheres that determine how uh, public health can work. And more people maybe who advocate for public health should run for office, should vote, uh, should invite uh, local politicians, state politicians to where public health happens, where healthcare happens, uh, talking to people in the community, inviting them to share their narrative with public health, to talk about the successes more. Uh, I think that's really important. We should just recognize that politics are part of public health and that's okay. All right. Well, I thank you very much for taking this time to present a wonderful overview of misinformation and disinformation in public health. Again, this has been Hot Topics in Public Health. And I thank everybody for joining us this evening. Uh, if you take a look at the screen here, uh, this is the uh, golden ticket for continuing education credit. Uh, so go ahead and text uh, the SUBBOK into uh, uh, 608 260 And again, thank you so much for your time and attention this evening. Take care now.